Okay, so let's try to get uh, started again with um, this thing. We used last week, we looked at this dummy variable. being uh, zero, one variables, and they were sort of indicating groups or what you might call it. So we had, um, the example was this uh, flat prices, of course. We had this town variable, which had the values originally one, two, and three, which were Molde, Christiansund, and Olesund. And we noted on the scatter plot that there were sort of a tendency that Molde and Olesund prices were up here, while typically Kristiansund had more or less the same tendency, the same square meter price it seemed, but on a different level. So we wanted to sort of estimate three separate uh, regression lines. Um, So the idea here, if this is x is the, the area, and this is y is the price. Uh, the idea was simply to make, uh, I think we call them d, m, d, k, and d, a. Um, the indicator variables that would sort of be one for Christian Sun was this one, and zero otherwise, and so on. So the model would be uh, something like this. And depending on what we choose as our reference category, the model will look a little bit different, of course. But uh, suppose we take um, mold as our reference market, then we need to include the indicator variables for the two other uh, markets or the two other towns into the model. So we have this general square meter price, beta 1, which kicks in as a multiple of x. And then we added, um, I think we call them beta k times dk plus uh, beta a for all the soon like this, and then the error term. So this is the, the classical way of modeling different levels of a regression model, uh, depending on a categorical variable. So we played with this. You probably played with this in the exercises, and uh, you have seen a bit of that. So I guess you have the, an idea how this works. Um, so clearly what, what happens here is that when this one, so suppose you have a flat in Christian Sun, then this one will be 1 and this one will be 0. So the model would read for Christian Sun, um, it will read simply y equal to beta 0 plus <coughs> beta k times 1, which is beta k, plus beta 1 times x. So you get the same linear model in x, but you shift the constant term with this amount, which we can estimate. So from the base market in Molde, you have beta 0 plus beta 1 x, and then we shift to Christian Sun by a fixed amount for all flats. Yeah. So this is how it works when we just want to model shifts in the level here. 
So let's take a, just a little moment to do something that is slightly more complicated. Suppose we suspect that not only the constant levels here, but also maybe the slopes. So um, it means maybe the effect of the area is different in the three towns. Um, in daily life, Tokyo would say the square meter price is different in the three markets, which is not unreasonable, of course. But we would need to, to check that. And then we are talking about an interaction effect between the x variable and this town variable. So the value of the town or the belonging in the town affects how this x variable uh, works on the price. That's what we call an interaction effect. So that's uh, the final little task in chapter 6. Um, so here, how do you want to also model individual square meter price prices in three towns? Now recall the interpretation that we use here is that this one, this coefficient here in the model is the square meter price. It's the marginal price of an extra square meter, right? So it's not exactly what you call square meter price in the newspapers because then they just take the price, divide it by area. But we also have a constant term here which makes a little difference but not much. So this is mar marginal square meter price, you might say. Um, so how, how do we want to model that? Well, it's in one way, it's, uh, it's actually quite simple. We, just extend the model in the same way as we did for the constant term. So what we did with the constant term was really to, um, to add a new factor here, a new constant beta k, which was multiplied with dk. So this term is either 0 or it's equal to beta k. Now what we want to do in this next step is to make this thing here, beta 1. We want to make this not a constant for the whole data set. We want it to depend on which town we're in. So instead of writing beta 1, I'm going to write beta 1 plus a correction for Christian Sun plus a correction for Ole Sun. And this does exactly the same to beta 1 as we did to beta 0 in the, the simpler model. Right. So interaction between town and area. Now this. So it's a fairly simple way to do something that is quite uh, handy and could reveal some interesting um, effects actually. So Okay, I see in my notation here I use a little bit different letters. So I see I use, okay, I wrote D2 for the Christian Sun dummy and D3 for the Ole Sun dummy. Here I wrote DK and DA, but they are the same, right? So let me just um, um, Yeah, whatever. I, I use the notation that I have on the blackboard, and you have the notes with the different notation, but you will see that it's the same. So what we do, we use like this. Y equals, OK, here is the main constant. And then instead of just beta 1, we have beta 1 plus, um, yeah. So I now see why I use this notation, because I get some trouble with um, finding names for my new parameters. So let's call it a k times dk plus a 
AA <laughs> DA times X and then the same as before beta K times DK plus beta um, A times DA and then finally some random error term and this now looks a bit horrible but it's instructive to see what happens with this model if I look at the, what does this model tell me about the flat in Molde well if the flat is in Molde then both of these dummy variables are zero so dk is zero da is zero so the model just says y equals to uh, beta 0 plus beta 1 plus 0 plus 0 times x. So it's beta 1 times x plus 0 times beta k plus 0 times beta a, which is 0, <coughs> and then just the error term. So for my reference market, the model is just the original um, linear thing. So given that I would know some values for the parameters, or I could estimate them, I have a line. And this is my model for Molde. Plus, I need something about the size of the error term. But basically, it's this line from all the. OK, now take a flat in one of the other towns. Take. OK, let me take uh, all assume to be in maximum conflict with my notes here. So, all assume flat. You know this letter is not in the English uh, alphabet. It's an A with a ring. It's called O. Uh, but I use A when I speak English. So, Okay, so what happens for a flat in Olsen? The dummies change value, but dk is still 0. But dA is now always 1. It has to be 1 for all Olsen flats. So the model goes we get y equals beta 0. OK, let's see. And then maybe it's better to look at the constant part first. So this one is 0 because dk is 0. But this one is 1. So this term will always be just equal to beta a. <coughs> Uh, like this here. Yeah. Well, it's just because I started this lecture with uh, choosing the wrong notation. Okay, okay. Uh, regarding, <laughs> I was not uh, syncing my notation with the. <laughs> so uh, I just decided to follow this further. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry about that, but um, I started the problem and now I'm just continuing. <laughs> um, right. So. For this Olesund flat, this one is 1, and this is just the constant. So we get this one added to the constant for all those flats. So you get this, which we can just add a parenthesis to it to see that it's a constant. And then here is my x variable. And something happens in this part also. Um, I know I need to be careful. So this one is 0. Yes. This one is 1. This one is a fixed constant. It's not affected by the dummy variables. 
So this dies because of the zero here, but this becomes just a a. Oh. So you get a beta zero plus some constant a a <laughs> times x, and then plus error margin or oh, error term. Uh, beta one. Oh, sorry. Good. Someone are more awake than me. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we have it there. And what does this mean? Actually, given that you estimate this, this will just be numbers. So you have your constant from Molde. So this is beta nu plus beta one x. But we're potentially adding something to it. So we shift the constant level to maybe here. So this is actually beta 0. And then this would be beta a. The difference here? Why do you assume that it's positive? Uh, I mean, it has to be either positive or negative. So in my figure, I just, it could be equally well. It could be equally well negative. Then we will be down here. Yeah. So just for example, it could be positive. right? <coughs> and then the slope, supposing now this is negative. So you have a fixed slope for Molden, but we correct it to Olesen with some negative, which means we reduce the marginal price. So it would look in something like this. And this would be beta 0 plus beta a plus the one plus a a times x, right? So, depending on whether these any of these effects are are significant, I can operate with a different slope and a different constant in my models with doing this. Okay, so this is the theoretical. Uh, thing, but in practice, how do we do this with SPSS? We have to take one additional step before getting this into SPSS, namely yeah, we need to actually multiply out this. So here it says uh, parenthesis, which is conceptually easier because then we see that we modify the, <coughs> the coefficient in front of x. But to actually estimate, we have to write it out completely. And then it will look like, in my notation, it will look like y equals, OK, let me pull all the constant. Um, no, let's leave it there. OK. So we have the, f the main constant there. And then we have our original beta 1 times x. And then we have something more interesting. We have a k times d k times x. Plus a a. times d a times x plus beta k d k plus beta a d a and error. So what you see that this interaction effect it it com comes out as a true nonlinear term because we are multiplying our variables here, right? So in that sense, it creates a kind of non or kind of polynomial nonlinearity, as we called it last week. But you remember how we dealt with that, I hope. That was one of the main topics last week. If you have terms like x4 times x6 in your model. That's clearly a nonlinear term. But it's easy in SPSS because you just create this variable and use it as a new 
individual variable. Right. So what we're going to do, we have to compute. First, we start with just the area and the town, and then we create the dummy variables for the model where we only shift the levels. But if we want to also be able to estimate the interactions, we need to also compute the product of x times these dummies. And then use them as new regression variables. So it's maybe, yeah. Think of it, either you understand it or not, but um, it's easy to do in SPSS. So we have to create in SPSS in addition to what I call DKSU, the dummy for Christian Sun and the dummy DASU for Olsen. We have to make two new variables, which are the product of the Christian Sun dummy and the area. So this looks, these variables are going to look a little bit strange. I can show you because I, no, oh, wrong. I cheated a little bit and did this in advance. But of course, it's just to take this dummy and multiply by the area over here. And then, for instance, for Christian Sun, you get something that is either 0 or it's equal to the area of the flat. Right. So this is actually what we have to include in the regression model to try to estimate or test the significance of such interaction effects. So now I showed you this. Let's just do the, the regression here and see what happens. Uh, yeah, so linear regression and the dependent is still price. And now we kick in. A lot of variables. The only thing we don't want here is this one, which is the original one, two, three categorical thing. That was what we deliberately replaced by dummies. But we could try anything else, I guess. Well, except one thing, of course. Uh, yeah, right. So we'll kick in this. And we must leave one of the dummies outside to choose a reference market, right? So let's do Molde as a reference market, and then uh, do this. Yeah. So we can run first a model which tries to estimate all of this. My output here. So, of course, we remember last time we did with the dummies and everything, we got an extremely high R square. So, it's almost, I mean, we're almost rid of all randomness here. And, you know, see a lot of coefficient estimates, and some of them are still not significant. For instance, this room variable. Uh, the age, but also these um, two interaction variables are not significant here. So it means we don't really have any hard evidence of a different slope on these lines. And we see also what we remember, remember from last time, or I remember it at least, <laughs> um, that the all assumed market is really not significantly different from Molde in terms of level either. So the main difference for the dummies is Christian Sun here and all assumed Molde here. And then some of the others are, are uh, also significant variables. So supposing you found some significant estimate here with a given value, that would be exactly the 
value that you should use in this way, right? So I'm not sure exactly. I don't remember exactly what is all in these exercises. There's something. Maybe there are some interaction effects that you can find significant there. OK, happy with interaction? Let's go to the final stuff. So maybe some of these things are quite, uh, can be difficult for some of you if you don't have much, uh, or if you have a limited uh, mathematical background, you might not like the logarithms that I'm talking about. But um, this is a very common transformation in, in economic models in regression analysis. So we need to discuss it at least. And um, it's not going to make any horrible disaster if, if you don't really get everything I talk about today. But you will see the ideas at least, and uh, you might run into this later. So let's see. Um, so there are some different assumptions here when we talk about some linear models and some nonlinear models in how um, say an x variable works on the y variable. So the linear model is the simplest. It just supposes when you go from x to x plus 1, you will incur an expected change in the y variable at size beta 1. So that's the meaning of the slope. So when I increase my, my area size of a flat with 1 square meters, or 1 square meter, I'm expected to pay this much more on average. And clearly, this works in some cases, but in other cases, this is definitely not the way variables are are uh, affecting each other. Right, so this is one example of a linear function. Now, a different situation is uh, what we call a power function. Typically, in for economics people, they usually call it a demand curve. So this is y. linear or beta whatever and this is uh, a power function with exponent called a and it might look like this if say a is negative then it will be sloping downhill but like this very nonlinear thing now, this curve has a very special meaning in, in, in the sense of how x and y are related. Because it means if you take some x value here and you increase it by um, I write like this. It's kind of silly notation. but. It means I increase my x value from here to x0 plus 1% of x, right? Uh, so if this is 200, I go to 202 and so on. Right, so I can increase with 1%. And this curve says, OK, expected. Or if it's deterministic, then this will drop by a% 
percent. So this particular curve that you see here, it actually describes the situation where when you go, OK, you have a 10 here. If I increase this with 1%, it's going to be to 10.1. Then the, whatever the value is here, it's going to fall by 2%, 2% of what it was. So this is the, um, the nature of a power function. And then you have a sort of a uh, way in between here. It's what we call an exponential function. And this you have seen. Anyone who has ever had money in a bank account has had an exponential growth of their wealth, unless they make uh, additional uh, inputs or withdrawals. So it means a uh, unit change in x, a unit change, gives a fixed percentage change in, in y. So then it's more like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yep. And if you insert some money in the bank and you have an interest rate of R. Oh, it's, yeah, notation is difficult here. But you know that it will sort of, for, e for each additional year, if you get the inputs just once a year of the interest, it will increase with a fixed percentage for each unit. But of course, it's a, it's a percentage of more and more, so you get this typical exponential growth. So this is with when r is negative or less than 1, it will be a decreasing curve. So that could be the value of something which is depreciated with a fixed percentage per year. For instance, a car. You buy it at this price. Um, and then it, it drops by 5% by per year if you multiply by 0.95. So this is a five percentage loss per time unit going on, going on, going on. And it will behave like this. Yeah. And this is what you want for your money. Um, exponential growth. So there are three basic uh, different uh, different uh, models. So yeah, this was the power function, and this I uh, wrote. Okay, let's say no. this is the exponential. Right. So you see, they are, this is linear, of course. So it's very different from those two. And those here too, they look somewhat similar, but they are they are distinctively different because in the power function, you take x and you raise it to a fixed number, while in the exponential function, you take a fixed number and you raise it to the x value. So they look somehow similar, but they are in some ways quite different. So what we want to do mostly today is to look at this thing here. And it's very often called, as we say, a demand model. It's the simplest possible demand model um, where the x represents the price of a commodity and the assumption is then that you, if you increase your price with a, s a fixed percentage, you will have a, a fixed percentage uh, drop in the, in the demand. So nor regardless of where your price is, 
the market sensitivity is given by this percentage. And it's this A, it's this exponent here, which is called the price elasticity. All of you who have done any economics has, at bachelor level has heard about this word. Um, it's generally a negative number, so you get this kind of behavior. So if you increase the price, you should expect to sell a lower volume, right? But of course, you make more income per unit because the price is higher. Um, and the interpretation of this A, the elasticity, is particularly that if you increase your price with exactly 1%, you will see a demand dropping with A%. Now, in typical bachelor courses, you will get an exact number for this. You, so you, you assume this is minus 2, and then you can do your calculations, find optimal prices, and so on. But in real life, we know that it's not going to be like that exactly. If you increase your price with 5%, then this theoretical model say you should drop demand by 5 times A percent. But there are other factors here that is not included in this model. So we instead of we have to realize some randomness in this picture. So we are talking now more about an expected relationship between the, the demand and the price and not a deterministic one as you have here. So in real life, maybe you're, you play with the prices in different periods. Here is quite extreme uh, range of prices. But anyway, and then you observe the demand. And you could see something like this. And OK, so. What do you want to do? Well, we want to estimate the best or the most reasonable demand curve given these data. So it could look something like that. But OK, so it will look like this. But where can I get these values here? Or where can I get the estimates for these values? Right. So it's a nonlinear model, so we cannot use linear regression directly. And we had some tricks. You remember if my model was like y, OK, yeah, uh, say this is a nonlinear model, but this is simple to handle in what we know, because we just regard x squared as a new variable. So if I have data y, blah, 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 x in an SPSS, I just take my calculator in SPSS and compute x squared. And I can estimate, I can forget about this for this particular model. And I estimate y as a linear function of x squared. So that's, that's what we did last week. This week, we're going to be much more sophisticated. Uh, right. And why doesn't this work in this case? Well, it says y equals to a constant times x to the a. And here, I just took the x to the 2 and computed the new variable. but. I have a big problem here. I don't know the exponent. So there's no way I can compute x to the a and then estimate c. But I have to estimate c and a simultaneously. So we need something more powerful here. So you, s you see the difference here? Here, in this case, the exponent is just known in advance. So I just compute x squared. But here, there's no way I can do that. 
So we need a third uh, way. If we say, I mean, we're talking about non-linearities here. So the first way is the polynomial type non-linearity, which is this kind of thing, or where you have products between variables. You just create new variables and do your linear regressions on these ones. The second type of nonlinearity <laughs> non was the categorical. Variable where you have like a town, one, two, three, and there's no way this price is going to depend linearly on those values. So to estimate separately, we use dummy variables. And that's why I call this the third way, is because we now need a third uh, tool in our toolbox. And this is going to be the logarithmus, logarithm. Transform. <coughs> so essentially, what we're going to do is similar to this. Here we took, we kept our y variable, and then we transformed the x to x squared. Now we're going to need to take y and x if they have this relation. You have your data here. And we're going to have to transform both of them. So we're going to transform y to something called, OK, I'm, I'm going to write it, ln y. And I'm going to take x, transform to a new variable, which we call ln y. And actually, we'll observe that these two guys are going to be linearly dependent. Hmm? So it's not that mm, different from this. We just have to transform both of them. And we have to use a special type of function called a logarithm. And to do that, we need coffee, a break. So we're going to need this, but let's take a break first. So 